This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. And uh, we are here this evening. I think we're going to be wrapping up, possibly, the end of the uh, ice dam arguments and evidence. Maybe. Right, Randall? Possibly. Uh, Well, (laughs) Russ, there will be no wrapping up. No wrapping up. There will be no wrapping up. I think you're failing to grasp the enormity Oh. of this thing that we're looking at. But so we'll do our best to come to rap. some kind of possibly po- point where we can pause momentarily. Okay. While we can uh, reestablish our bearings and try to stretch our comprehension by at least one order of magnitude. All right. That sounds good. As with many things, done is a moving target. Yeah. And right. as... As Norm, also known as Silent Guy Mike, also known as Normal Guy Mike, has said to me many times, I'm not thinking big enough. So, and he has said that to me many times. Many times. (laughs) Yes, I have. (laughs) But you're learning, Randall, you're learning. I'm learning. I I, listen, I've been resisting all along. I've been going, no, 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 we have to keep this thing within bounds. It has to be manageable. And then Mike says, no, you have to be thinking bigger. So, yeah, well, at this point, you know, I have, my thinking has grown to encompass the entire planet and I'm expanding it to the next level to encompass the entire solar system. And I hope just at least for a while, Mike, that will be big enough for you. But yes, definitely at some point when, uh, when we arrive at that stage, then we will we will extend to the galactic level, okay? We're moving towards singularity. <laughs> well, well, I wasn't going to go that far. You can at least expand out to the local bubble, right? There's, no, there's quite a few. No, no, I draw the line at the galaxy. Oh, uh, okay. But I don't know. Maybe, you know, hey, maybe we could go metagalactic. All right, all right. The galactic cluster, right? The, the, just the, the cluster of galaxies that we're involved in. Well, That's probably because you know we are have like we're in the midst of like a gigantic galactic impact. Yeah, there is an imminent collision <laughs> in two hundred billion years or something like that <laughs> with Andromeda. Andromeda or maybe it's two hundred million years. Yeah, it's uh, coming up pretty fast. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's going to be just right around the corner. <laughs> well, okay, we can be facetious, but when it comes down to it, I think we really are having to think about the galactic level here. Yeah. I, I when we look at the big picture, the long term, I think we have to recognize that there's some, some evidence pointing in the direction that what's going on in the galaxy ultimately manages to step down to our solar system level and then right down to our planetary level. Yeah. So I think we've kind of got, gotten onto that idea from time to time, but never really explored it in depth, of course. But um, there are various ideas how the galactic the the galactic plane is modulating events down here on a much smaller scale. And it's scale actually, invariant, right? Yeah. Well, I was going to say, how could it not? How could yeah. what's going on in the galaxy and the solar systems and the sun's relation to the galaxy not be affecting everything, right? Then we get down to the level of the solar system. We have to talk about the sun and the role of the sun. And I think we're ultimately going towards a model where we have an integration of galactic motion, solar system motion within the galaxy, the delivery of cosmic material into the solar system, the reaction of the sun and its response in the heliosphere, how that might modulate the uh, movement of comets through the inner solar system in the um, sub-Jovian orbital system, and then how that could interact not only the earth, but the sun as well, causing the sun to uh, erupt into short-lived phases of hyperactivity. And that in turn could then have a consequence on the earth. So 
we are just at the very beginning of sorting out these larger scale forces that have been playing a role in uh, planetary evolution for f- over 4 billion years. But I think we're kind of, you know, in the uh, evolutionary uh, development of a planetary system with higher um, sentient life forms. We're probably right pretty much at the halfway moment here where it might take four billion years of evolution to get to the point where you can have microscopic single celled organisms, say 600 million years ago, and then another 600 million years to get from paramecium to, you know, say for example, Kyle. And, um, just as an example, I mean, right. (laughs) Small first step, (laughs) (laughs) but, but here's, Here's the point I'm getting at. So once we get to this stage, we're kind of like poised right at that exact hinge moment in planetary history where for where where life itself has gotten to the point where it's poised to actually become transplanetary, to become um, become cosmic, if you will. Um, So it could be that that's ultimately going to be human's role in nature because life does want to be cosmic it came from the cosmos it wants to return to the cosmos in a transmuted form so it's taken 400 600 million years from the pre-cambrian times um down to now to get to the point where we can be here ready poised on the threshold of moving into the cosmic domain and how we do that i don't know but we got guys out there who are trying their best and my hats is, are off to all of these guys, whether I agree with them politically or not, I'm like, go for it, guys, go for it. You know, get out there. Let's get that cosmic perspective. Cause I think that might be one of the missing ingredients right now in the human psyche is we've lost to the cosmic perspective. So, you know, one of the things that's become apparent, which we need to delve deeply into in future episodes of the podcast is how ancient peoples all around the world, the technologies that they used, the systems and methodologies that they used to reintegrate their individual consciousness with the con- with, with the larger framework of perspective. So we're right now, we're poised at the halfway moment. I mean, this is it right now. Got it? Mike? Ra- uh, Kyle? Did you know you were sitting right there at the exact fulcrum at the fulcrum do you feel yeah. you feel kyle a little bit feel that little bit of that back and forth because we're kind of wobbling feel, on the fulcrum bit, feel a bit wobbly do yeah. you yeah yeah feel that's a little it bit wobbly okay <laughs> that's you know, between worlds yeah yeah and see a little I'm bit teetering of, on the edge a little bit of tip this way boom you know what's going to happen though see once life obtains an independent existence from earth see i this is, of course, this is just purely speculative, but if we wanted to come up with some kind of a model of how it might work, my thinking is just based upon probabilities is that it might take like one entire galaxy to produce one single planet that can generate sentient life, big brain sentient life. Because you know, the conditions that really have converged to make all of this possible for us to be sitting here at this moment right now, um, you know, it's a very exceptional set of circumstances. And how, how often would that be reproduced? Now, we can see, oh, look, there's a lot of Earth-like planets out there. But if one of those, pl- if those planets, if none of them have a moon like our own, Similar size, similar distance. If it doesn't have a size, you know, almost comparable to our own, uh, the, the distance from its star. I mean, the specific narrow range of circumstances that allowed for this to happen may be so exceptional that, you know, you take the moon away, boom, we're not here anymore. We're just a bunch of amoebas swimming in the ocean. So you're saying that the it's possible that the answer to Drake's equation for our galaxy is, is one. That's, yeah. That's what wow. I'm suggesting as a possibility. And it what could be that, existence. 
there are others, right? But again, here's the question: as we as we're beginning to see uh, ex, out, you know, extra solar systems and other planetary systems, and as we get better at learning about those, you see, right now, I mean, how do you do probabilities when you've only got w- one data in your base? I mean, right, yeah. y- y- there's <laughs> you know, there's no nothing to compare it to. Um, so all we can do at this point is speculate. Okay, and here's another possibility. Maybe there's thousands or hundreds of thousands of incipient worlds out there. And it's just which one reaches the stage of evolution the first begins to move into the galaxy. But perhaps... And they would all do the same thing. They would all be thinking, we can't possibly be the first. Well, as we get a a much broader uh, and a more extended cosmic perspective, I think we're going to be able to... For one thing, once we've got, you know, high resolution telescopes in orbit, we're going to be able to see a lot more about what's going on in the neighboring, in our galactic neighborhood. And we'll begin to see these planets that could possibly harbor life. Um, Which brings us, you know, to the whole realm of exobiology, which I find incredibly fascinating. And something we definitely need to devote some time to. And um, I think perhaps at that point, get Wick Ramasinga back to to drop in for a visit. Oh, yeah. Not necessarily to talk about diseases from space, but the whole idea of of panspermia. panspermia. Yeah. Yeah. Because no matter how you slice it, it comes down to what a mysterious, bizarre miracle that this even exists. Every time I go walk outside and I see a glorious sunset i go well, why should it be this why shouldn't it just be a constantly gray bleak environment you know with just a you know a barbaric struggle for existence and you know i mean the, when you start thinking about the beauty and wonders of nature it's like well okay we just accept it that's part of it you know and so many people spend you know, they walk around. I see them all the time walking down the sidewalks, coming out of the stores in the parking lot, maybe after work. And they're just a beautiful, glorious, breathtaking sunset. And they're walking along like this and their masks and all masked up like this. And nobody's looking at the sky or looking at the parking lot. It's now getting all littered, of course, with masks everywhere because and nobody wants to pick them up and touch them. Uh, don't get me started, Kyle. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I'll change the subject. <laughs> okay. So definitely lost the sense of awe. Yeah. With it was Lao Tzu that itself. said when men, what was it, Brad? You got it. You almost had it there. When men lose the sense of awe, that's, that's when it all comes down. I'll pull it up on break. It's a great quote. Yeah, yeah. It is. Come up with it either. Yeah, I know. What you in mean. fact, I think we'll make that quote our tagline for a while. All right. Anyhow, All right. Um, we've been talking about these great epic floods up in the Pacific Northwest, the so-called Missoula floods that uh, J. Harlan Bretz originally named the Spokane floods. Um, but. Uh, I certainly like the name Missoula um, and, you know, the Missoula floods because it's presumed to be caused by the draining of Lake Missoula. And what I've been doing is suggesting all along, and this is, you know, my cue is taken from David Alt's comment about the lack of very typical um, lake type features that one should see, you know, where are the varves, where are, where are the, the, uh, the fossil, where's the remains of the fish that would have been in that lake? Um, where, you know, where's the plants, the vegetation, all, you know, all of that, you know, the, if you had a lake existing for 50 or hundred years, you should have a very distinct shoreline deposit other than a mere trace, which is what the strand lines are. They're basically traces. They're not real shorelines. That's why it's, it's really not correct to call them shorelines because, you know, if you typically, you have a lake, that exists at a fairly stable level for a while, it will build a shoreline with very distinct deposits, right? What you have with the the strand lines is they're simply just almost, just like almost surface features. You know, they don't have much depth to them, which again, like what Alt was suggesting or implying is that because they don't have that depth to them, that there's not like 
mounds of gravel that have been built up, you know, from waves washing, um, which is, which suggests that they're ephemeral, that the, that the water levels that are producing them are short lived, you know, not 50 or hundred years, maybe only a matter of a week or two weeks. But we can certainly see um, when you have floods, and we can see all kinds of floods today that happen, and they are going on now, um, without any necessarily greater frequency than they ever have, even though the, it's being spun that way. I mean, if we look into, you know, the history of paleoclimatology, and we look at floods and, and fires and hurricanes and tornadoes and all of those things, what we find out is there have been periods where you know, the planet is extraordinarily active or certain regions of the planet. And I'm compiling right now a very compelling uh, body of research and data about past events and the magnitude of some past events that people have, have lived through. And one of the things we'll be getting into, well, probably later into the fall, we'll start talking about some of these cosmic firestorms, uh, the Peshtigo fire, the Hinkley fire, uh, the great blow up in, in, uh, Idaho back in 1910 that, um, interestingly local people and local, um, uh, legends have that it was, uh, somehow connected with the passage of Comet Halley in 1910, which is an interesting year. Remember we talked about this Comet Halley, um, the big burn, you know, these, when, and when we talk about it, you'll see that these firestorms are just ungodly in, in their intensity, their ferocity. Um, is yeah, it will be getting into some, some of that, the, the Peshtigo fire, the Hinkley fire, where it was estimated the cyclonic firestorms, uh, that reached up to five miles altitude. Um, you know, move, moving, moving 50 and 60 miles an hour across the landscape, just literally incinerating everything in their paths within a matter of seconds to a few minutes. Yeah, there's some extraordinary stories there. And this was what I really, what I researched when we did um, uh, Fire from the Sky back in 1996 when we were filming that. And that's leading up to that. I already knew about the fires. And I knew that. Um, Ignatius Donnelly, interestingly, circling back to Ignatius Donnelly, because he was the one who, you know, really repopularized the whole idea of Atlantis, his early 1880 books, um, Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, and um, Ragnarok, the Age of Fire and Gravel. So in there, he basically, and, and we talked about that, you know, really one of the very earliest shows, shows when we went through his 13 propositions, and we showed how um, two of them were geologically based. And the 1977 book that came out, um, Atlantis Factor Fiction, where Dorothy Vitaliano, who was the editor and, and one of the co-authors of the book, basically wrote that, no, we know enough about the oceans to dismiss that idea altogether. And if, if the two geological um, uh, the two geological criteria of, of, for the existence of Atlantis are, um, are wrong, then none of the other 11 exist. I mean, uh, have any merit. So that was the way to get around all of the other 11. And so when we circle back to the Atlantis theme, which we will, which we will, because there's a whole lot of other, uh, other dimensional stuff, because see, we basically dealt with his first two propositions you know, that there was this island in the mid-Atlantic area and that it was destroyed in a cataclysm. Essentially, those were the two propositions. We dealt with that. But he had 11 other propositions as well. Some of these, through, through you know, what we've learned uh, since then, don't really have, have a lot of relevance. But there was 11 of them, and some of them still do. And so it might be interesting to circle back and then see what we can find out about, like, for example, some of the Central American peoples, particularly the Mayans, and their, um, their, their legends and stories of Atlan, right? So, anyways, I guess, what, where was I going with all this? Well, that's um, that we have to circle back at some point to Atlantis and the firestorms. Oh, yes. Okay, so, so uh, Ignatius Donnelly, in, uh, in his book, I think it was Ragnarok, 
he proposed that um, the Chicago Fire, and, and you know, this is this is something. This is really one of the truly remarkable coincidences in history. Is what happened on uh, October eighth, eighteen seventy one. You know, Kyle, what is the greatest, most famous, most devastating urban fire in American history? If you well, had to take a guess. I'll just say the Chicago fire. I was going to say, yeah, if you need okay, a hint, cool. I was going to give you a hint. Moo! Moo! Oh, uh, yeah. This, the but, you, cow. but Kyle, O'Leary's you were... Cow. You got it, yeah. Mrs. O'Leary's cow. Right. Well, uh, that actually turns out to be a relatively appropriate metaphor, especially when we get into the symbolism of the Egyptian goddess Hathor who you know was also the cow goddess, right, in her benign form. But don't, don't piss her off, because if you pissed her off, then she transformed into Sekhmet, the, the vicious, destructive, de- all-devouring lion. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You didn't want to mess with Sekhmet. But as long as you behaved yourself and didn't insult her, she stayed Hathor. So, anyhow... um. Chicago fire, Sounds greatest urban <laughs> fire. Now, if we go back and we look at the stories of the Chicago fire, we find out that right around October 8th, 1871, it's a Sunday, and it was a drought time. It was, it was a, a, a convergence of, 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 of effects that all sort of came together that day. It was a prolonged drought in the Midwest, and about 8 o'clock, Sunday evening, people begin to notice that the sky began to turn orange, right? Now, about 200 miles north of there, 250 miles maybe, was the little town of Peshtigo, Wisconsin. Now, do you know, Kyle, what is the greatest forest fire ever documented? It must be the Peshtigo fire. Very well done, Kyle. All right. (laughs) Okay, well, here's the coincidence that most people don't know about. You can collect, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of eyewitness accounts. And what do they all say? Okay, down in Chicago, they're saying it was right around 9 o'clock. And all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. And fires suddenly burst up. And, you know, sheets of flame uh, rose up and, and in, enveloped entire city blocks within a matter of seconds. Right? North of there, Peshtigo, same thing. And eyewitnesses say it was right at 9 o'clock that evening. So 9 so o'clock. It wasn't being spread. What? Yeah. It wasn't being spread. Not from Chicago, no. This was an yeah. in, a separate fire. This was a forest yeah. fire. And it was simultaneous. Basically. And it came on yeah. as a tornado. And it came so fast that people... And Peshtigo was a mill town, so it was right on the river, the Peshtigo River that flows into Lake Michigan, right? So when this when the fires first started coming on, people started running for the river, and it came so fast that, you know, they, some of them didn't get 150 feet before they were overtaken by the whirlwind of fire. And uh, pretty much like a, a buzzsaw, it just cut a swath, and the village happened to be in the way, the town of Peshtigo, and there's in the aftermath, just like at the Hinkley Fire, of 1883 in the aftermath there's a swath that's five to 20 miles wide and there's nothing nothing except some old charred stumps but in a lot of cases like in both of these fires and this is unusual right is that the root systems themselves had had burned and you could come in with a poker like somebody was commented in one of the um in one of the accounts that I've got, came in with his, his, you know, could poke right down in and in the roots, right down to the tips, had become ash. And yeah, so we're going to get into that, and and, and we're going to look at that and, exp- and and examine the idea of whether or not the fact that the greatest urban fire in American history and the great fo- greatest most destructive forest fire in American history both ignited simultaneously. Coincidence. Well, maybe, but maybe not. 
So that's what we're going to be looking at. That, so that's coming up, folks. We're, we're, we're going to be getting into that in great. So I, I had the opportunity of going, you know, when we were uh, researching uh, Fire from the Sky, and I interviewed the the curator of the fire museum up in Peshtigo. And he was, I'm sure he's gone now. He was probably in his early 80s then. This is 95 or 96, 96. And uh, he gave me access to a lot of these unpublished eyewitness accounts that I was able to make copies of. And some of this made it into the show, but very little. We know the segment that we did on in on, on that, the Peshtigo fire and the Chicago fire was just a few minutes within the 50 minutes of the show. And I wanted to do a follow-up and devote a whole show to that because there was enough material, but it didn't materialize at the time. So it's something that might still be in the future is to really do a, a proper treatment of telling these stories. But uh, they're hair-raising, truly hair-raising. And then there's something else which I call the X factor because I don't know what else to call it. But it's where, I guess you'd say, where some of these events of such a magnitude and such of an intensity that it's almost as if something else becomes part of the whole process. And I don't know what to call that something else at this point, except perhaps maybe the supernatural, but we look at that and it, it's compelling stuff. And it also gives us a perspective on some of the recent fires out West a few years ago that were of extraordinary intensity. Back to Ignatius Donnelly. So it was old Ignatius that pointed out that coincidence. And uh, okay. yeah, so that's, wow. that's how we're circling back to that. The same guy that, and of course, what did he, uh, hypothesize was the agent for all of this, the destruction of Atlantis and the triggering of these firestorms, a comet, a comet. Yep. So we get we get a lot of really good ideas from from Ignatius and and of course he's been derisively dismissed by you know the academics because he was willing to speculate and of course you know he's going to not get everything right look this is like 1881 1882 you know he didn't have the the data and the and the knowledge and the the information that we got now but he was definitely ahead of his time he was very insightful and, you know, the idea that, you know, the legends and the stories that have come down to us are not just the, the you know, the baseless imaginings of, you know, pre-scientific illiterates running around in their, you know, loincloths and Birkenstocks, but actually we're, we're conveying real valuable information that we could have scientific relevance. And of course, in that respect, he was way ahead of the the, you know, the geomythologists, which is now becoming a, a legitimate field of academic study, geomythology. You know, the idea that there's, as with astromythology, the idea that mythology actually contains vital, specific data and information that can be used. And it's not, it, it's not purely, you know, a psychological raving, raving, which it's portrayed. Oh yeah. Because they were filled with fear. So they had to invent some model, you know, to try to explain that, which they didn't understand. Well, I think we've shown enough with our studies of the great floods that, well, yeah, I mean, hell yeah. Anybody that managed to survive some of these floods, um, and, and, and pass, you know, have ch children and grandchildren. Yeah. You think, well, yeah. I mean, if we had a flood right now, let's say that destroyed 95% of the earth's population, the other 5% that, that, that survived would probably be telling stories about that. Wouldn't they? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it would be pretty scary when it was happening too. So yes, the fear part is also, mm -hmm. would also be there. Yes. And each group would think they were the only ones that survived. That's right. How would they know otherwise? <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. Right. I mean, because if you've, uh, if you've survived in isolation, just like, look at this landscape behind me. Now, this is the Waterville Plateau. Uh, you in like Eastern... you're the only one out there. Yeah. You're I am. Definitely the only survivor of that event. <laughs> I, am. Yeah, I am. Yeah. Well, I was washed up on the shore just behind me here by that rock. I just had time to dry my shirt for the podcast. No, but if you look in the far distant horizon, there's a low mountain range. Well, 
during the meltdown, I'm I'm on a ridge. This this picture is taken on a ridge that's overlooking the Colum- So behind me would be looking east, in front of me would be looking west. It drops down about two thousand feet to the bottom of the Columbia Valley, and there's the Columbia River. And it comes up, and then there's a ridge right here, and then behind me is Waterville Plateau, and way, let's see, over here, way off in the distance right there, you see there's a mountain range? Okay, during the meltdown, this entire field behind me, from the ridge I'm sitting on all the way to that mountain range, was a gigantic, turbulent, super sedimently sediment-charged river moving from my right to my left all headed down to the Columbia Columbia River and ultimately out to the Pacific Ocean. But yeah, so, and also, yeah, and strewn over the whole Waterville Plateau are these gigantic boulders. You can see one of them right here. That boulder was being carried aboard an iceberg. So you have to picture that if you're seeing this, this turbid sea of water moving, right, it's choked with icebergs. It's not, you're, you're, in fact, some of it you may might not barely even see the water because there's so many icebergs in it because this is the ice sheet that's being broken up. And we know there's thousands of icebergs because of the number of erratics that are beyond the limits, the glacial limits. So in other words, you've got Okanagan lobe there creating more rain, showing how far it came. Well, how do you get a big erratic to the south of that? How do you get a big erratic beyond that? You raft it aboard icebergs. That's how you do it. And there's thousands of them. Some of them were carried in glaciers, but mostly the glaciers, if they if they quarry this basalt like this, their tendency would be over any protracted period of time that that basalt is going to get ground up into gravel. You have to take friable, large boulders, probably some of them weighing 100 to 200 to 100, even some up to 1,000 tons or more, and transport them without breaking them apart. So you can't do it in the water because if it's water itself, even if the magnitude of the water is enough to uh, pick up uh, an 18,000 or let's say a thousand ton boulder as part of its bed load, it's not going to last. It's going to break all the pieces, right? A glacier. Okay. You, how do you get this? There's not mountains to, to dump this. How do you get all of this onto the glaciers? See, that's, when we're, we're trying to reconstruct these processes in our mind, we, we get kind of stuck there because we, it's very difficult to visualize exactly how you're going to get such an enormous number of these huge boulders. Well, there are ways. And I think we, you know, in, in, in the model of Lake Missoula outburst flooding, there's not really a way to explain that. But I think in an altered model, which is that the entire southern uh, sector of the Cordillera and ice sheet is undergoing a massive simultaneous catastrophic meltdown, which includes superglacial water flowing off. It includes subglacial water flowing underneath, and it includes massively mechanical fracturing of the ice itself, as you would expect, say, in, in a, a, a really intense seismic event, right? And so now you've got to break up the ice sheet You've got to load the ice sheet with, with these basalt boulders. So how do you do that? How does that, if you were, if you were hovering in a, in a, in a spaceship, Kyle, overwatching all this, what would you be seeing during this? What is this? I don't know. I, I mean, I always imagined that they, that these boulders were like that the ice was around the edges of cliffs of mountains. And then, then when it starts to move, it breaks these pieces off. But now that you're explaining it in this way, it's making me think that the impact or maybe multiple impacts threw up ejecta that landed on top of the ice. And that's how these boulders are being rafted in some cases. Maybe in some cases, but in this case, you know, when we're looking at the Waterville Plateau in Boulder Park, we're, we're looking at um, basalt. So yeah, I this mean, is not coming from the mountains. This is coming True, from yeah. the plateau. And I think what I'll do is I'll show you where I would believe exactly that they're coming from. Um, I will just pull up my maps right here, and we will go up. And in some of those channels, too, I mean, there's plenty of 
uh, exposed basalt for the if there's yeah if there's uh, icebergs scraping up against the walls of these cliffs they would be falling over on on top of them and I don't know right okay so I am going to um, do my share screen here. Also, I, I looked up that quote. It's, uh, when men lack a sense of awe, there will be disaster. There will that's, be disaster. That's what it was. And that's Lao Tzu. Yes. Yes, good old Lao. So think about that for a minute. When men lack a sense of awe, there will be disaster. There will be what? Disaster. Right, evil star. Evil that's star. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, see? <laughs> Right there, it's embedded right in right in our yeah. language. Yep. Think about catastrophe. Right at the middle, aster catastrophe. Yep. Aster the star. Yeah. Come on, people, wake up! It's right there. All the signs, all the symbols, all the omens, all the indications are pointing to it. Should I tell a joke that Brad will have to cut out? I. <laughs> uh, I think you, yeah, go ahead and tell a joke. We're going R-rated, remember? <laughs> well, this is one my dad told me. What happened to the woman who backed up into the airplane prop? <laughs> oh, my God. Disaster. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Kyle, I mean, Russ, <laughs> that's your dad, little brother. Dad, blame, dad blame humor. Blame on my dad. Hey, that was, dad that was the dad's joke. Oh, that yeah. was your dad. That's even yeah. worse. <laughs> All right, can we see this? Yes. Okay, we're looking at we're looking at Google Maps and here is the Omac Plateau right here and we see Omac Lake. Now, we explain this but just to kind of uh revise your um your mem- uh, re- um revive your memory, the original uh flow. Now, p- picture. Here comes the Columbia River, right? Before, if this basalt plateau wasn't here, it would just flow right on through and head right down here to Walula Gap. You see that right here? Look, it's almost a straight line, right? So that would have been the original, you know, if you're back 18 million years ago, the whatever we want to call it, the the pre-Columbia would have been this. So now you have all of this basalt flowing from the Lewiston area in this area down here coming out like a big multi-pulsed flood drowning this whole landscape so then what happens now the columbia river gets diverted okay so it's following around like this and then you can follow it it's right here you see what it's doing i mean it's defining the edge of the basalt plateau comes around here and then this is the same basalt as as down here it was all continuous at one time see um let's zoom in there um and so the Columbia River went around the northern tongue of this Columbia basalt. Omac Lake, you know, would have been part of that river channel, came around this way. And then, again, right here, where it's following down, it's just de- precisely defining the edge of the basalt plateau. So when you're here, it's basalt. Across the Columbia River, it's granite. Okay. So now it comes on down the Columbia, come on in, come on down, would have worked its way around. We don't know exactly, but obviously it ended up pretty much down here at Wallula Gap, right? At that point, Wallula Gap is undoubtedly much shallower than it is now. Um, one of the things that happened was the with the basalt pouring out, it actually, the whole, you think of the basalt as like a big plate. And it's tilted. It's somewhat tilted towards the southeast. See, so the low, the low sector in the perimeter of the basalt plateau is pretty much right down here where Wallula Gap is. So it's natural that any water flowing across the plateau is going to be heading down to this, the down right down here, which is at about what six thirty, you know, on the clock. But so now let's go back up here and picture what happens. Coming from the north, we have the Cordilleran ice sheet growing, right? It's it's flowing down the valleys. What happens is first the glaciers begin to accumulate up in their mountain glaciers, montane glaciers. And when you see these big uh, 
amphitheater shaped eroded areas in the mountains, the, the cirques. While, while I'm talking, Kyle, why don't you look up cirque and get a, get a couple of images for us. So you've got the cirques. That's where the, the glaciers are accumulating. Of course, once the bowl gets filled, and and actually, it's interesting. It's it's like in the accumulation, almost doing a slow rotation, and then they're discharging out down the valleys, and then the valley glaciers meet, right? The tributary valleys meet in the main valley, which is now filling up with glaciers, and it just it just keeps building up and building up until finally, only the peaks of the mountains are sticking above the ice sheet. The ice sheet might now be thousands of feet thick, right? So you, you got several things happening simultaneously. You got the, 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 the main trunk glacier growing, moving south. It's being fed from the sides. It's coming in. And so look what happens. That ice encroaches and becomes a dam against the, the Columbia River here, see? Now that ice pretty much keeps coming. Now, at the same time, bear in mind what's happening is you see that the Columbia River goes way up here, way up here into the headwaters, way north, okay? We actually went up there and found the headwaters of the Columbia. That was an interesting trip. And what we found up there was quite interesting in itself. But that's another story, which, of course, we'll come back to. But anyways, all of this is, all of this is ice. Right, so there's there basically at the peak of the ice age when the Cordilleran ice was all the way down here, there was no Columbia River, there was marginal meltwater coming off. Right, so picture what's happening: the 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 river, which would be coming this way, it rises up against the encroaching ice, and then it spills across this tongue, and over a succession of probably. 12, maybe 10 or 12 ice age cycles lasting two and a half million years, it's cut this new pathway and created this deep gorge right in here. I will, uh, if I jump over to Google Earth, did we, do I have to reshare? Uh, I think so, unless it's in the, no, the you're, same, you're on that it's same, same tab. Yeah, okay. Okay, same good. Same tab, yeah, that's fine. Okay, same, so same you could hit F11 right and go full screen. Well, let's do that then. I could do that, couldn't I? Ooh, yeah, look at that. Okay, so here we are. There's the OMAC Plateau. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to 3D. And we are going to look here. And we got some pictures here too. Good. All right, we'll come Turks. back to those. So, so right here you can see where the river cut across. Now, the thing is... I want to zoom in, and you see right here you have exposed basalt cliffs. I would say that those exposed basalt cliffs, uh, primarily on this side, are the source of the great boulders that are strewn. Let's see if we can actually see the boulders. We see a lot of kettle lakes. See these kettle lakes? Now, these kettle lakes are where you had a, an iceberg. At one point in the later stages of this, you had an iceberg sitting here. And you can kind of see how the, the lake is somewhat depressed. Well, all around here, you've got thick sediment layers that was being washed. Probably, I would say, here's a, pro a place to use the term glacial fluvial because the sediment here is going to be both um, glacier-derived and flood-derived. Um, but you see, if you've got an iceberg sitting, it's embedded into this sediment. So the sediment might be 10 feet, 20 feet, 50 feet thick around it, right? The iceberg melts and it creates a kettle lake. See? So there's an iceberg sitting right here. And over here, an iceberg sitting here. Iceberg sitting here. You see, ah, look at here. Oh, here we go. Well, look, we can actually see the boulders that are on Boulder Park. And all of this is uh, basaltic debris in here. You see? Look at all of that. Now, is that just glacially transported? Well, see, there's the thing. Is there, if the glacier's moving in slowly, are they going to quarry thousands and thousands of boulders, or is the ice just going to basically come down here and fill this up? Because, you know, slow-moving glaciers, 
in order to be erosive, a glacier pretty much has to be a temperate, fast-moving, surging glacier. Then it can become more erosive. But if you've got what I think here is a combination of glacio-fluvial erosion on a really intense scale, let's go back, orient this to the north, back on out now. What we found when we went up on Yomac Plateau with Jerome, that's Jerome Lessman, right, was that the whole landscape up here is drumlinized. We probably can see some of it when we, let's see. It's not as obvious as some places, but yeah, there are major drumlins, and a lot of these are actually bedrock drumlins, right, that show that there was subglacial floods moving under the ice. Now, we know that this whole Columbia reach of the Columbia River across here is going to probably be filled with ice because look, it came all the way and built this mooring that we see right here. So this was the southernmost limit of the Okanagan lobe right here. And we can see the relation here of Grand Coulee to the Okanagan lobe, and we can see Moses Coulee to the Okanagan lobe. What we don't see is any obvious connection that would connect any channelization that would connect Moses Cooley with water presumably coming from all the way over here out of the Clark Fork Valley, right? Because in the standard model, all the water is coming from Clark Fork Valley because it's a draining of Lake Missoula. So now picture this. We'll, we'll look at the map. Water's coming out of here. So if, if it's draining Lake Missoula that has created... Moses Cooley, it's got to get all the way across here. Presumably, it could go where the Spokane, follow the channel of the Spokane River, and it could follow the channel of the Columbia, assuming that there's no ice there, right? Because you can't have ice there, because if the ice is there, it's going to, what's going to happen? That water is going to get deflected south, and oh, just coincidentally happened to flow right where Telford Scabland Tract is. So now you get over here. Okay, so. Boom, what's happening here? Well, let's see. I think I've got a quote here from, we were talking um, last uh, episode by uh, the uh, Larry Jean Hansen's, uh, right? Um, so what Larry Jean Hansen speculated, and we quoted him last time. Oh, that's on page 60. He says, a, a possibility clearly exists that one or more ice dammed lakes other than Lake Missoula served as the source of the Moses Cooley floodwaters, right? And why did he say, well, because he began to see the, the difficulty of getting that water and, and see Grand Cooley can't be here. Moses Cooley has to precede Grand Cooley because if Grand Cooley is here, any water coming from the East along the, the Columbia river, which presumably would have been along the Southern margin of the, uh, uh, of the Cordier and ice sheet, it's just going to get def deflected. It's going to get shunted immediately to the south and flow down here. So it's not going to it's not going to erode Moses Cooley. But if if Jerome is right, and I think he is, that you have water coming from all the way up here, following the Okanagan down, and when it hits this area, it channelizes here. It follows this. It deepens Omac Lake. So Omac Lake is one of those many, many scoured out troughs that were left in the wake of the highly erosive floodwaters. Some would have come down this way. Some would have come right under the ice sheet itself. Now you got a picture that that water is coming under ungodly pressure, right? And what happens then when that water hits this and that pressurized high pressure water is hitting these cliff faces. I think that's where the quarrying of of oh, uh, wow. of uh, Boulder Park basalt took place. But all that's happening under the ice. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. And but remember, the ice the, to to make it com more complex, the ice is in the process of of breaking up, of, of disintegrating. Yeah. Okay. Yes. It's disintegrating. Um. So it's happening under fragmenting gigantic chunks of of glacial ice. Sorry there, you broke up a bit there, Russ. No, I was just reiterating. So you're, yeah, it's happening 
the water is doing the most of the breaking up at the of the rock, but it's taking place underneath an enormous amount of fragmenting, shattering ice that's in the process of disintegrating. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. And that water is then passing under the ice, and right here, you see it begins. This is where you can actually see the sheet of water that's going to be covering the whole landscape. This is the normal process. We've talked about this multiple times, right? It's the sheet always will, because of the fact that you don't have perfectly uniform substrate, there are going to be zones of weakness that are going to erode faster than others, right? So you have a sheet flood moving across, but it begins to selectively erode an area that had, that's more susceptible to erosion. So that area becomes deeper. So as it becomes deeper, more water funnels into it, right? As more water funnels into it, you have more, uh, more hydraulic forces at work that then accelerate the deepening of that channel. And so this is essentially how you have this transition from a sheet flow to a channelized flow, right? And because once it creates the channel, then the channel at some point will get deep enough where it can capture most or all of that water that was dispersed widely through a much shallower sheet flood. But now it's much narrower and much deeper, but it's this, the presumably, you know, similar volume of water. Um, so that's what we see right here. Look at this. We can zoom right in and we can see some of the first down cutting. Look right here. We see some of the first down cutting, some of the first channelization taking place right here. And then it gets progressively deeper. And then we've got Grimes Lake, which again is now a body of water occupying a trough in the basalt bedrock that um, was over deepened because of the, sh the tremendous shear forces, you know, working on the basalt, it, it gouges out these troughs. And we can follow the channelization right on down. And look at what's happening here. Look at this. Look at this. You see this? So you've got, you've got sheet floods coming down this way, and then they get diverted to the west and do this. And then we've got a confluence, and then the water curves around. Look at this. See, now it begins It begins carving Moses Cooley. The, and here we go. Here we go. Look at this. And you can see that there's evidence. See, look at this. The water was flowing up here at one time. And then, okay, so here's a channel. The, that had to have been cut, this was a secondary channel. Once this had been down cut enough, you undoubtedly are going to have enormous masses of ice, residual ice, dead ice, still accumulating all over the plateau. This is going to be melting down. It's going to undoubtedly, if, if, if after the catastrophe, we, I think it might be safe to assume that the normal seasonal progression is getting interrupted for a while. A few years, a decade, a few decades, I don't know. But at some point, we're going to reestablish, you're going to have your normal seasons or somewhat normal, you, you know, because this earth is still going around the sun. You're going to have a sun, a summer, winter, and so you're going to have a summer melt season. And during the summer melt season, you'll have accelerated melting of all of the residual ice. Then winter comes on, that'll stop for six months or whatever, and then... It continues, and so this residual ice that's melting and this final drainage of meltwater off the plateau is what's doing this, cutting these. Because you see here how the mouth, and look at this. You can see, look at this, see the fan splayed out here? Can you detect that? Yep. See, this is sediment. Sediment fan from that secondary yes. channel. Yeah. yeah. Is this a road there that we drove down? I believe so, we Yes. Are we make it. Yeah, that we far? went. We went through those farms. I remember going down through the farms. It was just, God, yeah. it was beautiful. I yeah, know, amazing place. It, and we're going to be back there in a few weeks. God, I can't wait. That's yeah. But now, look, look at this. So going back up. I mean, I'm sorry to divert. Oh no, here, that's but, fine. Uh, back up where you were saying. You see all that um, sort of turbulent rock after it comes out of the lakes areas, that that goes to the um, up here to the east. Yeah. yeah. So is that the confluence of two different flows there? Something else is coming from the east and it's meeting 
with what's coming from the north? Like it's it's that's going around the, the the edge of the glacier there. Yeah, that's the edge of the morning. Well, the edge of the glacier. Or did it, yeah. or did it yeah. back flood to the east? Well, I mean, it's right there. It's the edge of the moraine. So what I'm guessing is that if you dug into this, it's just huge mounds of sculpted glacial till. Okay. but Instead yeah, of so bedrock. I, I don't know. We, I guess we maybe should go back there and uh, see what we can find. Yeah, I wonder if there's a way to tell if, if there was a flow direction or is that just like turbulence or something? I mean, well, I think the flow why. direction would be from east to west this way. So there's another flow coming and meeting well, up with yeah, and coming probably out of coming Lake. right off. Because see, top. remember, in the kind of event we're looking at here, I think we need to be looking at supraglacial as well as subglacial. Gotcha. Now, yeah, I'm also That's going crazy. to assume that if you have a melting event, a flash melting event to the north, which produces both superglacial flows and subglacial flows, the superglacial flows are going to reach the margin first. I think because there's going to be less obstruction, less friction, the subglacial floods are moving under tremendous pressure and friction. So I think it's likely that they... Yeah, if, if the superglacial glacial flows reach the margin without falling into the ice, yes, they would reach yeah. the edge first. And see, <laughs> here's... just add more pressure to the... And, yeah, and here's the thing. If we're talking about a simultaneous fracturing of the ice, you can begin to see that the, that the subglacial flows are going to be constantly fed. Yeah, it's going to be constantly being increased by all the... And then, yeah. on top yeah. of that, undoubtedly, if we're talking about an ice sheet impact, we're going to be talking about tremendous injection of water vapor into the atmosphere Yeah, that's going to be right. raining out over days. And that and and so now you have to start factoring that in. You're gonna have uh, you're gonna have water raining out torrentially right back over the ice sheet itself. Yeah, it looks like you know you see all the minute erosion in the farmland there. Uh huh. Right. That's probably going north to a certain extent. There's a there's a um a gully or something you know a ravine going in from the east to the west. It looks like the water's just coming from everywhere. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Look, at, you're talking about this right here. That, and yeah. there's, even in the farmland, look at the erosion in the farmland. Uh-huh. South, South of it. Moraine. It's, it's minute. It's it's small stuff, but it's it's headed towards that mounted up. That's, it yeah. just looks like water's coming from everywhere and going everywhere. Yeah. Well, that's, I, I you know, that's, I think, exactly what's happening. Water's coming from everywhere and going <laughs> yes. everywhere. And going in. And it, it, yeah, the confluence there in, in, in Moses Coulee. Yeah, I mean that's and and see we if we go up here look here's Mansfield let's see we should let's see if we can get uh, Jaeger Rock I found Jaeger Rock um, remember Jaeger Rock yeah I do. maybe that's it right there let's see no no let's see well we don't need to find it now but it's in there somewhere yeah, there's just they're all it. you can see that's where they're it. that's <laughs> it right there yeah. That's it. They're farming all around these giant boulders. Yeah. <laughs> it changes their patterns and stuff. But see, Jaeger Rock, I want you to look at Jaeger Rock's here and look at what starts right here. So if we were, if we just walked across this field right here is like the very northernmost start of Moses Coulee right here. Oh, wow. So yeah, I think it's interesting to see the connection because undoubtedly, as all of this water is funneling towards this direction, right here you had an iceberg. In fact, you probably had tw two icebergs, one here carrying this boulder and then one carrying this one. And they would have stranded right here and been sitting here. And so, see, that's the other thing is that you've got the thousands of icebergs, but on hundreds of them, well, even thousands of them, you've got this cargo of erratics. So yeah, then we pull out, and and look at this. I'm still not totally yeah, look at those streets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw that. Yeah, wow. I'm still not entirely clear how the erratics are being mined by the water that's below the glacier. But you ever you ever used a top. pressure washer? Yes. Okay, just think of that. Think of God's pressure washer. Okay. Blasting up against those cliffs. Right. Right. It would spray. It and, would go and upwards. Yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. 
Yeah, so I guess you're saying okay, some of the rocks will end up on top of the ice, even though they're being mined beneath the water and the ice. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, okay. that's what I'm saying. Right. That's what I'm saying. You're catching that's up, hard to Hard to, yeah, that's... And not all the ice in that scenario is going to be above water. I mean, some of it's going to get submerged in that turbulent process. Yeah, it it's, it's going to be... It wants to be above water, and the rocks do not. Yeah, that's, but that's so my when a rock's <laughs> trying to get underwater, and a, and a piece of ice is trying to get above water, water yeah, they may meet they in the middle meet. somewhere, and, and yes. Right. And, uh, you're right, okay. The one thing we, you see is that we're looking at a process that's almost inconceivably chaotic. Yeah. Because so in an impact event like that, a hypervelocity impact, you have to think about now terrestrial nature, the physics of, of t the terrestrial world have to somehow come up with ways of dispersing and absorbing this unbelievable amount of energy that's yeah. all instantaneously introduced into the system. So, yeah. Uh, well, we need a little chaos, you know, yeah. to, for, for things to be beautiful. And, right, uh, it does. It does make beautiful things. We are Very we large. are up at an hour. All right, so let's yeah, take. You want to look break. at these pictures, and then we'll take a break. Yeah, let's take. Quick. Let's see what you found. Okay. All right. For the Cirque. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Okay. You're gonna need Six. that afterward, Randall. So there's one. Oh yeah. Um, I got three. Okay. There we go. Bowl shaped okay. accumulation. Now, of course, during the height of the ice age, this entire cirque is filled. Right. And we pulled up images last episode or before that have the showed what the Nunatox. Uh, Nun yeah, yep, yeah. We have shown the those peaks, before. the peaks yeah. sticking out the, of the yeah, because that's basically ice. what the situation would have been. You'd see these, and mm. okay, and then the last one is is uh, this is a Google Earth image, but somebody put the um, yeah, yep. Yeah, there we go. In there. And uh, how do you say this? I think it's Arete. And there's a UFO, by the way. Yeah, mm -hmm. I noticed that up there. <laughs> well, yeah, they are, you know, and horns. Yeah. Okay. So those might have been the Nunatox. Yes, that's that right. That's ice. right. They okay. would have been. The horns. That's yeah. right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. And lots All of right. those are typically very circular, thus the name. Those those aren't so obviously, um, but definitely they, they held glaciers at there's one a, time. There's a good one on Mount Shasta. They're just totally like a bowl, like it's just sitting there in a bowl. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah there, were, there were a lot of those. I, I was looking for large images. So, oh, yeah. okay. L large, yeah. Yeah, I think, we, I think we've got a lot of contributions from people uh, guessing that those are impact craters, but they're actually cirques. Right, they're cirques. Yeah. yeah, there's a good one on Mount Shasta. It's like there's a beautiful picture of the mountain, and it's got this oh, yeah. perfect bowl indentation on one side. Uh, so, all right. Well, Don't let's get tricked by the cirques. <laughs> let's take right. a break, Very and good. we'll be back. All right, we're back, ladies and gentlemen. Cosmographia returns for the second segment. And uh, I guess the wrap-up on uh, wherever Randall's going, I'm not going to try to predict it. <laughs> but before we get back into that... Neither, neither am I. I want to mention CBD from thegods.com. Check out the website, order some products, and uh, get better sleep, and... Uh, relax the muscles and uh, put in the promo oh, yeah. code RC ships free and get free shipping. Yeah, I mentioned last episode that I. Yeah, sorry. I mentioned last episode that I. Just wanted to thank everybody for had... supporting the show and uh, <laughs> you know, uh, in in the many ways that you all do. So thank you very much for that. Go ahead, Randall. Absolutely. Yeah, I just wanted to mention I upped my dose from uh, to like a dropper and a half and. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, I think if you're bigger, like over 200 pounds, 250 pounds, you probably should up the dose a little bit. But, um, yeah, man, I noticed the difference. You know, that that good night, solid sleep. And I've been hearing from some other people that I personally know here, same thing. Like Ian, the restaurant owner, says, you know, that we've mentioned, you know, that I built the wheelhouse. He's... Uh, commented to me just last week when I was in there that but he's been using it and um same effect he says he's getting really good night's sleep 
And, uh, you know, with the studies coming out now about how important good restorative sleep is, yeah, because I can tell you what, man, when I don't have, especially a couple of nights in a row without good sleep, uh, I'm not, I'm not, all cylinders don't fire. There, I'm, I'm missing some stuff. There are gaps up there. <laughs> Definitely a notice, noticeable difference between a, uh, uh, a tired Randall sleep deprived Randall and a well rested Randall. Oh yeah. And especially if you're working outside and doing, uh, construction or manual labor, gotta have that sleep. Yep. Gotta, gotta have, have it. it. It's brutal when you're tired. Yep. It is. All right. So we were talking Moses Cooley, one of the very impressive scab land features. And, uh, I might as well just go back there, pick up where we left off. All right, we should be looking at Google Earth, right? You got it. Okay. Oh, yeah. So we followed the Cooley. Interestingly, if we look at the morphology of Moses Cooley, you'll see there's an upper Moses Cooley. Then you have this diversion to the west. And then... Within there, you've got this amazing plexus of butte and basin and channels here. Look at the streamlined erosional forms right here. And this is called the uh, Rattlesnake rattlesnake Hills, I believe. Uh, then it comes down, and then you see it makes this other sharp turn to the south. And this is now lower Moses Cooley and, and notice how it how it stretches down pretty straight and then it's got these benches along the edge here a lot of sediment some of the times there's been 200 to 300 feet of sediment in other words if you were to get a giant broom you could sweep this out of here and this there'd be an inner channel that would be several hundred feet deep And then we come down here, and we see some. That's the area that was full of orchards, I think, right? Mm, we drive through there? Right those, in here, yeah. Some of those lines in the next to the fields up there were long lines of orchards. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Look at this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of debris left in the wake. And this is Douglas Creek that flows there now. Now, I was just going to say that Douglas Creek didn't create Moses Cooley, in case you were wondering. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm going to say it looks like they had a fire that year. I think so. And on then we east, get down here to the side. mouth, and here we had two huge flows coming together. And this whole um, fan that's splayed out is mostly the material – that's excavated in the cutting of Moses Cooley. And some of it went up this way. Actually, it goes, you can see that it goes all the way up. You can see the remnants of current ripples on it. Most of them had probably been obscured from development and so on. But all of this is part of the same gravel slash boulder bar all the way down to here, wrapping around. And then look what you got right here. Here's West Bar. And here you've got some of the most spectacular current, giant current ripples on Earth. And, and that place, that is huge. Yeah. I just, I remember where we pulled over across the, the overlook, river. across yeah. the river. And it's just, it's gigantic. Yeah. We, I believe, pulled over, this was, the pull-off is right up in here. I think that was yeah. it. Yeah. Kind of looked like that. <laughs> yeah, or where, let's see. Where that big, that right there. Yeah, that's where we pulled off, right here. Look. Oh, look, there we are, right there, <laughs> pulling off. See, that's Brad waving out the window, I think. So, yeah. So, we were there overlooking onto West Bar. Yeah. Now, interestingly, here, Lynch, this is Lynch Cooley. It was being fed by Crater Cooley. Crater Cooley was, as we talked about, was the... The, um, the highest spillover point from Quincy Basin. And this is Quincy Basin right in here. 
and it had three spillovers that we talked about. Crater Cooley, which I don't think we got to, but you can't really get in there too much. Um, you can see it from below. I, on one of the trips, we stopped down here, and you can actually see it from here. But I remember we, we stopped there, and we're looking in binoculars, and those guys came out. Turns out there was a marijuana farm in there. So these guys came out all concerned because we're across the road looking at binoculars. Like they thought we were, you know, I don't know who they thought we we were, oh, but yeah. um, they were, they didn't like us. That a, guy with the beard is trying to get our weed, man. <laughs> well, I think they figured it out because I saw them kind of coming up and I pointed up at the coolie and I think okay. they go, okay. Was that when you guys had the big black SUV and Brad was, wear, Brad was wearing his dark sunglasses? Because that probably would have freaked him out. Yeah, I think that was it, actually. Yeah, I, right. I think I think it was actually. Yeah, that was that's, that year. That's it. That's why they were freaked out. Okay, then see this is Babcock Ridge, and then down here this is Babcock Bench. And I want you to look at the texture of Babcock Bench. And got an interesting quote from Hansen's work here. And then of course this is Potholes Cataract, and this is this is an amazing feature here. You know, and here's your rock blade. Um, you know, and here you can see the, 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 the rounded hole, the rounded lakes formed by turbulence, vorticular turbulence, water coming from the east, spilling over Babcock Ridge and then cutting, eating its way through the ridge. And of course, if the flood had continued for any length of time longer, this would have been a continuous, um, uh, excavation through here. But you can see the water out here. Well, 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 look, let's see. Right there, I'm at 1,108 feet. And then when I get down here, uh, let's see, down here to Drumheller Channels, which is right here, I'm at 1,050. So uh, we can take some uh, elevations. And let's see, where when we get to the right up here? Okay, here's 1,200 feet, 1,220 feet. Um, so, yeah, so the water has to be um, deep enough that it's going to spill over the ridge, right? So that's a lot of water coming into, into Quincy Basin. One of the major conduits just, uh, contributing water to Quincy Basin is the flow out Grand Coulee. And all of this is the big Afrata fan. And uh, Rush, you will recall that on our um, Q and A, Randall responds we did. We I think we addressed one of the questions was um, he was wondering why there wasn't scab land in here, and I pointed out that oh, yes. this was a this was actually a stilling basin, right? And a lot of sediment was washed into that area, and I don't know the depth of it, but I'm sure there are plenty of well logs that would tell you how much it. But I'm going to guess at least several hundred feet of sediment mantling yeah. the floor of Quincy Basin. Okay, so take a look at Babcock Bench, which is which is this, and the texture of it, because I'm going to read a quote here from, from Gene Hansen where he's comparing Babcock Bench to um, uh, up in Moses Cooley. And then we have Frenchman Cooley, which was another spillover, and we have a rock blade there. And we have alcoves. These are the terminology. This is your typical morphology that you're going to have under extreme fluvial erosion. And uh, again, coming from the east. And then, so your elevation here is, there's 1,300 feet. When you go down to the Columbia, 574. So you got about 800 feet differential between here and the Columbia. So you got a picture. This would have been one hell of a waterfall for a little while. Um, yeah, so right here is right here where my cursor is. That's thirteen hundred feet above sea level, and this is oh, right at six hundred feet. So you know, thirteen hundred feet and six hundred feet. That means you you'd have you'd have had a seven hundred foot waterfall there, unless of course you had major flooding in the Columbia, which you probably did. So at the peak of the flood. The water in the Columbia, and this is something that I haven't done yet, but you would have to do, is to determine the ultimate depth of the uh, Columbia is you'd have to go up into these tributaries and find back flood sediment. 
And that back flood sediment, you know, will tell you how high the water rose. Because like, see right here where I'm at there. So I'm 934 feet there. So if I'm 500, let's say 600 feet here. So if the water was 300 feet deep in the main valley, it's going to back up into these tributaries quite a ways. And when it drains, it's going to leave calling cards, sedimentary calling cards. And it's going to be fine-grained silt, probably almost uh, rhythmically deposited perhaps, um, especially if there were pulses or surges of meltwater coming from the north. Okay, so then we go back up here. So here you, you can begin to see the, the, the interrelatedness of these various features. So here's Moses Cooley coming down. But you've also got enormous floods coming down the Columbia. Now, when we go back up to Moses Cooley, this is, um, now, uh, I'm going to read this. This is from um, Larry Jean Hansen's work from 70. This is his doctoral dissertation on Moses Cooley. And um, he's, it's called a section here, The Problem of Babcock Bench. Okay. He says, Bretts and others in 1956 and Bretts in 1959 implied that the first, by this time, Bretts is thinking that there may have been as many as seven floods, right? Because he, of course, all this time now he's been studying this landscape. And the more he studies it, the more complex it gets. So in order to um, try to explain this, the vastness and the complexity of this landscape, it was getting more and more difficult for a single Flood. Now, bear in mind that by the time we get to 1956 and 1959, we're well entrenched into the draining of Lake Missoula as the source for the flood. So the problem now becomes that in Brett's original idea, you had multiple sources of flood water coming off the southern margin of the Cordillera and Ice Sheet, right? Now that has been abandoned and all of the water is coming from out of Clark Fork. So you can see what is happening here. We go from, to me, is a very simple model where essentially these various features are, are being created simultaneously, not sequentially. But when they shifted to the outburst flood model and all of the waters are coming from back here up the Clark Fork and out, now it's sequential, not simultaneous. Because again, as you begin to look at simultaneous model, and it's all coming out of this same position, the same location. It gets, it gets, introduces impossibilities within to, within the whole scenario. And so, what you have to do now is you have to hypothesize that there are various configurations of the ice lobes that are shunting the the water, the single source flood water, into these various coulees and and scab land tracks at different times. In my opinion. What has happened, this is one of the things that's forced it up to 40, up to 90 separate floods. And this is where I'm saying this is getting impossibly Ptolemaic. It's getting so complex that I think we need to circle back and make sure that there is no force in nature that could cause the kind of simultaneous melting as Brett's was initially envisioning, see? And this is why that paper that Jerome Lessman co-authored with John Shaw, I think, was such a milestone, is because the paper um, in 1999, July of 1991, back to Brett's, says maybe we need to circle back and reconsider. Um, so coming back to Moses Cooley, here's, here's what he's He's looking at the erosion in Moses Cooley. He's looking at the sedimentation. He's looking at the degree of erosion. Now, the assumption is, is that at this point is that Moses Cooley happened some, some indeterminate span of time before the other, com, the other tracts of, of erosion, right? And so still neglecting the problem of how the water got from the mouth of the Clark Fork over to here without cutting a very obvious channel, because if that water was being shunted around, if the Okanagan lobe was there, if the Okanagan is not there, and Grand Coulee is there. Well, you're not going to get water up on the plateau up here. You see, it's all going to divert south. So Grand Coulee can't be there in this model. Moses Cooley has to come sooner, right? And, well, then the problem becomes, well, where's the water for Moses Cooley coming from? And that was the problem that Hansen saw when he said, well, maybe we should think about other sources of water. Because where's the channel that gets that shunts 
you know, four or 500 million cubic feet per second from here over to here. It ain't there. There's no channel there, right? So now here's what he says. He said, now by the, by the late fifties and early sixties, Brett's has even now said, well, we'll say, God, if all the water's coming from over here, we need more floods. One flood isn't going to do it. And so he's up to thinking there might've been up to seven floods. Now this is, this is 1959 in his, uh, 1959 paper. Um, Brett's and others, uh, implied that the first of the postulated seven plateau floods was not diverted onto the Northern Columbia plateau and that therefore a dam of the Okanagan lobe did not exist. So in other words, if it was not diverted out onto the Columbia, that's because it went all the way around and wait, Richard Waite picked up on that because there was an enormous flow of water that came down the Western reaches of the Columbia over here. And I'm going to zoom in and, and you're going to see something else um, that I think is very indicative that is not explained by the conventional model, Alta Lake, because he, I'm going to, I'm going to go to 3d and you're going to see what's going on there. This is a coulee coming right down through here. Look, you can see the pathway of the water coming right down here. You can see a huge bar right here, very flat. Um, in fact, there's even an air, air uh, strip out here because it's so flat, right? And all of this is splayed out from the mouth of this right here. Well, where did the Okanagan lobe come to? This was the edge of the Okanagan lobe right here. This is a huge spillway that was cut by waters flowing between the western margin of the Okanagan lobe and these mountains right here. So now when you go and look at this, you got to say, was Alta Cooley here cut by water literally coming from way, way over here? Uh <laughs> you know, way up here. So somehow you get this water that's filling these reservoirs back here. It's got to make this journey. It gets out here and flows all the way across. And then it comes over here and cuts uh, Alta Cooley right here. Okay, now clearly the Okanagan lobe is here right? Because this is an ice marginal drainage channel. So this is telling us this drainage channel is, is funneling water between the edge of the Okanagan lobe. See, look here, here it comes, you can trace the lobe right down this way, right? And here comes this water down. As soon as it gets clear of the lobe, it spills out. And so is this best explained by water coming from Western Montana, or is this going to be explained better by water coming from the North? Water coming from up in this area. Well, I leave. Yeah, it. I don't. I don't have a problem so much with water traveling a long way and then doing work miles and miles and miles from its source because it does that. It does that. The, yes. pro the problem here is that there's so many other places it could go first. Yes, and that's, that's the problem, right? And okay. the the Okanagan lobe is here, so the you got to get yeah, the water. What do you, what's around it? it around yeah. it? Around it? Right. Under it? Over it? Really? Over is it, it going <laughs> to? Well, yeah. clearly, uh, Grand Coulee couldn't be here, could it? No, right. because and and there's no way that this is just a question I just thought of. But if if that Grand Coulee channel was somehow overwhelmed, would water want to go to the west? Right? Is it is it higher on the on the east side of that channel than the west? Right here, where my where my cursor is. Uh huh. Uh, we're looking at oh, about eighteen hundred feet above sea level. Okay. Right here, it is okay, about so yeah, twenty two. It so it has want to go east. If it was overwhelmed, if the channel was overwhelmed of Grand Coulee, it would go east, not west. Right. So that's not that you can't even say that that the Grand Coulee channel was overwhelmed, and that's how you get Moses Coulee. Right. Because remember, the the the, the uh, water would go to the the east. monocline is here. Right. Okay. So you're jumping up, you know, because this is what's happening. I think that Moses Coulee. I mean, it doesn't it make more sense that Grand Coulee is being carved by water rushing along the edge of the Okanagan lobe that comes down yes. here. The Okanagan is here. Water is discharging from beneath the Okanagan lobe here. Over here, you've got water pouring down 
the western margin of the Okanagan lobe, creating this feature right here, Alta Coulee. Now, this is what, what um, way back in 1970, this is what um, Larry Jean Hansen was saying. He says, um, um, uh, so in order for, and of course, this is what they're saying, is that for this water to come down here, see, listen, um, that the first of the postulated seven plateau floods was not diverted onto the northern Columbia Plateau. And that, therefore, a dam of the Okanagan Lobe did not exist. Because if it was, it would have been diverted onto the Basalt Plateau. But there was a flood of water that came right down, and he's not even mentioning Alta Cooley here. But there was a huge flow of water that came down the Columbia that was ultimately being fed. You can follow this pathway that it cut right here. And then it splayed out and built this, this delta right here. The, the, this terrace right here, okay, they suggested that this flood developed the high-level scab land and surface of Babcock Bench, which, you know, we just were looking at uh, when we get down um, down here, right? Over to Quincy Basin. Yeah, over to Quincy Basin. So there, there, Babcock Bench right in here. So they suggested that this flood developed the high-level scab land and surface of Babcock Bench south of Lynch Coulee. Lynch Coulee is right here. And probably entered the Columbia Valley via Moses Coulee. This in turn implies diversion by the Okanagan Lobe across the scab lands of the Waterville Plateau. And that's what he's getting into. That's the problem of the Babcock Bench. The Babcock Bench and the areas between there and Moses Coulee are particularly significant. Bretts and others in Bretts in uh, 1969 stated that Babcock Bench records two floods separated by a time sufficient to allow the higher 12 to 1300 plus feet and earlier scab land to be subdued before the second flood created the lower surface. Um, and we can probably see some of that in here. Look at here. See, here's, here's an upper surface. Um, so here you've got an erosional surface here. And then you've got this level, and then you get down, you know, to this down here. So you've got these different levels. Um, so anyways, he says, uh, 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 okay, so he goes, and I'm going to skip some parts here because we're going to run out of time here. Um, my study does not support the observation that two genetically unrelated scab land surfaces exist on this bench. The more sharply defined surface below 1,200 feet is physically separated from the upper scab land by a broad, low bar. The bar surface is very irregular. The irregularities are due to the superposition of the bar sediments on well-developed scab land, similar in texture to the lower scab land into which the downstream margin of the bar grades. Um, on the west side of the valley, above west bar, Flood stripped surfaces also grade from a sharply developed scab land, again below 1,200 feet, to a weakly developed scab land from 1,300 to 1,350 feet. Now, see, that would make sense. The water's up to the deeper level, scouring a bench with scab land, right? Then it drops down, the water level lowers, and now it's scouring the second level, which is lower. And because the water spent less time at the deeper level, than it did at this level, the 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 scab land type erosion is going to be not as severely developed on the upper surface. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, he says this scab land development, like that of comparable elevations on Babcock Bench, is more likely related to one flood. The higher channel surfaces have been ro eroded less intensely than the lower levels. Um, but then he goes on here and he says, the freshness of the Moses Cooley surface, the degree of preservation of the Scabland surfaces of Babcock Bench is comparable to that of the Rattlesnake Springs cataract system, okay, which is what we were just looking at, the um, Rattlesnake Springs Scabland uh, cataract system is all of this in here. Okay, there are cataracts. Let's see, specifically, oh, 
let's see, there's, yeah, I mean, there are cataracts. If I go back to the 2D, I think they might be a little bit easier to see. So you're um, back in Moses Central, Moses Cooley there. Yeah, back in Central Moses Cooley. So what he's saying is he's looking at the erosion here. Yeah, look here, little rattlesnake spring, see? And he's looking at this stuff right here, and he's comparing the erosional and the weathering and the recovery of the erosion, comparing this to what's going on down on Babcock Bench. He says the degree of preservation of the scabland surfaces of Babcock Bench is comparable to that of the Rattlesnake Springs cataract system, which is in turn virtually indistinguishable in form and therefore probably age from tracts of Grand Coulee. These features okay, suggest that less time separates flood events in Grand Coulee and Moses Coulee than is suggested by Bretts and others. Um, mm. That's important. He says, although Moses Cooley Luss was not studied in detail, it's similar similarity in thickness to the Luss of Quincy Basin and Grand Coulee Luss suggests that Moses Cooley is of comparable age. Um, uh, along the walls of the upper Cooley, one can compare taluses developed following both the flood and withrow outwash events. Again, there's no indication that a major time interval separates the events. Now, I'm skipping over a lot of this just to get to the key idea. Um, but, see, the actual evidence of the field suggests that Moses Cooley and Grand Cooley are the same age. See? Now, how significant is that? It, well, you can't have sequential. I mean, once once Grand Coulee is created, you can't get Moses Cooley, so they can't. You can't have the sequential model unless both unless of them Moses Cooley was first, and that's what they're assuming. And if you remember, remember how when we traversed Upper Moses Cooley, we pulled over, and yes. right here, look at that. this. Yeah. Let's yeah, come back. There's um, moraine. In the, the moraine. Yeah. The moraine that drapes down into the coulee. Now, this the suggestion is that the moraine, you had Moses Coulee cut, and only then did the Okanagan lobe come in and deposit the moraine because and the moraine, would... in other words, Moses Coulee has to be there. Or the moraine's not going to be draped right. down into it. Right? Yeah, so they think it, they think However, that. that... That moraine is very is much older than the most recent floods that carved everything else. And Moses, well, that would Cooley be the would, assumption because yeah. mo, in that model, Moses Cooley has to form first. From where, though? From where? I, you know, that's the problem. Okay, then you've got the Okanagan lobe comes in second in that sequence, right, and deposits this. But then the Okanagan lobe has to be there to shunt the water coming from the east down across the coulee. I mean, across the, the, the uh, plateau. Down, down Grand Coulee, yeah. Yes. Now, we have Gene Hansen way back in 1970 saying, well, I've looked at the lust, I've looked at the erosion, I've looked at the sedimentation, and everything looks like it's all the same age. And that there was no, okay, that leads us to at least the consideration that, well, is there any model that would work where they were flowing simultaneously like Brett's originally thought. Well, if, if you're confined to thinking that every flood had to come from Lake Missoula, well, you, you, I think you've reached an impasse right there. You know, you, you, you've got to begin invoking all of these separate events that are happening sequentially. And yeah, then it gets to me impossibly complex. And I, I'm going to stop this share for a second, and let's see if I can't. Okay. Yep. This is what I'm proposing. I'm proposing simultaneous massive flash melting from the Cordier and Ice Sheet to the north, and that it is all happening simultaneously. And these would be the main routes through which water, flood water is being channeled. So get that picture in your mind. So here you got, here's that, you know, uh, that's Moses Cooley right there. 
And here's the upper Columbia by the Great Bend region. And it's showing flood water coming down. Moses Cooley is flowing. Or no, let's see. Yes, that's Moses Cooley. Grand Cooley would be right up here along the eastern margin of the Okanagan lobe, right? Then you've got the Columbian lobe coming down right here, and that marks the head of the Telford Scabland tract. And then Cheney Palouse, you've got a major flow coming down through the Purcell Trench. And then I would say a major flood coming down this way, discharging off the Flathead Lobe. And this would be right here where Flathead Lake is, and this would be Mission, Mission Basin in here. And then down here is Missoula, and then this would be um, the Bitterroot Valley that we looked at in, in I think, the last episode um, when we were looking for evidence of typical uh, fine-grained lake sediments, and we didn't find any. Yeah. Um, so I want to show, I know we're getting to the end here, so I, you know, I'm always looking for images and things, imagery that can help me um, get a sense of what this would have been like for a witness. So I got a couple of good ones here. This is um, from uh, Ryuz. Ryuz was his name. He was an artist who, who he illustrated. He was most well known for illustrating Jules Verne's novels, but he did illustrations for this um, uh, book by Louis Figure, who was a geologist who wrote a book on the earth and basically, you know, invoked catastrophes. He was a catastrophist. So I kind of thought this was pretty interesting. Um, that might be kind of a, a, a clue as to what kind of things were going on in the atmosphere at the time. Check out the, you know, the city here. Yeah. The, the, the mastodons and presumably some people there, uh, probably in the last moments of their existence. That's right. Um, <laughs> and then we have this also by, uh, Illustration by Edvard Ryu, The World Before the Deluge. And right here, I think this is this is our transport mechanism for these a lot of these erratic boulders. And this is what you would have seen, a turbulent, stormy sea choked with icebergs, and a lot of these icebergs would have been carrying huge boulders. And I think that this particular, when I first saw this years ago, I thought, wow. Okay, this was not specifically in terms of reference to, you know, the Missoula floods, but man, it sure does capture the 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 scenario, I think. Um and the 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 scale of many of the the flows that would have been Now the next one, the next illustration was actually um illustrating the Black, the Black Sea flood. Remember which 7,500 years ago when they were estimating that the, uh, oh, what was the, the straits there that would have been breached and then you had a big flow into the Black Sea? You heard of that, right? I have, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So anyways, th 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 that flow would have been comparable so to some of the uh, Scabland flows, and that would have been about 300. Yeah, here we go. Visualizing a flow of 300 million cubic feet per second. So, you know, here's the village, it's, Yeah, you know, and it kind of gives you the sense of what we're talking yeah. about here. And, you know, Baker estimated flows in the Rathdrum Prairie of more than double this. And then this was from uh, Albert Churchward's book. Wow. And I think this, again, this is going to kind of show us, help us visualize what this process involved. Yeah, that one's a little more abstract, but still that's really yeah. interesting imagery with the monolithic ice pieces back there in the water and the people running in the foreground. Yeah. 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 So I just threw this in because this was ah. showing, you know, three stages. This is, you know, was during an intense rainfall, 19,500 cubic feet per second. Uh, this is, between this and this is pretty normal, but this is, this is a major flood. But, you know, between the peak discharges of the Missoula flood 
and this. Okay, so the Missoula, the peak Missoula flood flows, roughly 36,000 times greater than what you see right here. That's when you get up to the 700 million cubic feet per second. Yeah, visualize that. Yeah, no, you you can't. Uh, it's it's almost impossible. But what, what you can do is you can spend a week, a couple of weeks, going over these landscapes, and only by doing that do you begin to get a sense of the scale of this thing. Now, you guys are about to spend your second week. Um, Actually, we... We already have at the time that people see this, we will have already. Oh well, that's our right. Week out. <laughs> that's right. We're already back, Randall. We're. All... <laughs> We've had our second week out there. It was fantastic. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was going to be so cool. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Looking... The other thing we have is is the um, ancient texts. People recording. Yeah. Their yeah. And, accounts and, of disaster. And you know when you see and begin to comprehend these phenomena firsthand, then you go back and you reread the stories from, from olden times and yeah. you can kind of get a new perspective on. And of course, I mean, the thing is, is that, you know, I mean, the circumstances that we're talking about here really aren't conducive to leaving witnesses. Right. Yeah. You know, that's, that's one of the problems. So somebody who, does manage to survive by some fluke, they're going to come out in the aftermath of this and they're going to look and, and as far as the eye can see in every direction, the whole world is going to have been destroyed. They have yeah. no way of communicating with anyone else. They have no way of knowing if there are other survivors. So eventually, yeah, you know, if you have a small group of survivors and they manage to begin to procreate and slowly at first and then at accelerated pace begin, um, you know, repopulating the earth, eventually these disparate groups are going to grow and they're going to encounter one another. But it may take a thousand years or 2,000 yeah. years. You don't know. And you can imagine that there probably were some trade routes that perhaps there were cities in these areas that were just completely destroyed and thousands of feet of rock removed that maybe some people further south that didn't experience the major flooding may have been had trade routes that went up there. Mm -hmm. So they would have had a catastrophe to a certain degree where they were, but then they go up north and w there's just nothing. Like every, the entire landscape that they were familiar with is just gone. It's gone. And so they come back to their people and just like the whole, everything was destroyed. It's just like, you know, I mean, how would you even... It yeah. would be so strange. You wouldn't you wouldn't recognize the landscape that you're traveling through. You're like, that's right. I don't know. That's just that's it's it, yeah. There would be mind boggling. There would be hills imagine. where there weren't before, and valleys where there weren't before. Yeah, yeah you would say they would they lakes trade. and stuff. You're like, yeah. where am I? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It would not be the same world anymore. Yeah, right. And so it would be very forests. Would it would be, be gone. Be, it would be mysterious. Yeah, yeah. And, for sure. And, you just, know what like, we've been covering now over these dozens of episodes. You know, looking. I hope people have gotten the, the begin to get the picture that if you if you follow this, this the whole thing that we've been doing here, you're really going to come to an appreciation of how vast this phenomenon is. I mean, we we basically tried to show how it encompassed an entire continent. Now, oh yeah, could we move beyond that? Absolutely, we could. Absolutely, yeah. we could. We're talking about a global event here now. Or a series of global events, you know. Now, when it comes to the multiple flood idea, this is where it gets interesting. And and I do think that there were multiple floods. But on the scale of 300 to 700 million cubic feet per second, I would question how many floods there were of that magnitude. Now, as we've talked about, getting from full glacial maximum, where you might have had a million cubic miles of ice over the Cordilleran region of Western North America to now where hundreds of thousands of those, at, that ice is gone. See, this is, I think what we have to be looking at that whole process. And it seems that the current discussion and understanding of 
the Missoula floods is not looking at the big picture. You know, and this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to say, well, let's look at the formation of Grand Coulee and then let's look at the formation of Cuyahoga Lake over in Western New York. And you know what? They might've been created under almost exactly the same processes. The difference then being what happens when you put mega flows on basalt as compared to, to friable layers of shale. And then you have an envi- a post flood environment in one that's 15 inches of rainfall per year. And then the other 50 inches of rainfall per year, plus a lot of snowy winters with, you know, spring runoff. But other than that, we may be looking at a very similar process creating the Finger Lakes of New York. Look, you had Finger Lakes right there on uh, at the at the top of uh, Potholes Cataract, right? There yeah, they, they were, like, splayed yeah. out, right? I would say we should be considering similar processes there. So there's, there's a whole lot more to talk about these floods, and we're definitely going to be coming back to them repeatedly because – new research is ongoing, you know, and as the as ideas come up, I'd like to get some of these ideas out there in the record before the mainstream guys go and think they're the first ones to come up with it. Okay. So, uh, that's part of it, but that's an it, excellent goal. <laughs> and what I think you've, I think you've established that Yeah. in the past, what are we at? 75 episodes like a Yeah. But I, I think it's clear that when you, when you look at the whole context of human history, there's probably no more event or series of events that is of more direct relevance to understanding the human story on planet Earth than these events we're looking at here. Yeah. And, it's, and it's no coincidence, I don't think, that you know all of the cosmological accounts from all of the myths of the world put the flood right up there second only to the creation itself, you know, in terms of importance and significance. Biblical, yeah. same thing. You have the yeah. creation, and that's immediately followed by the story of the great destruction. And, yeah. and you can see the same, the same theme, whether it's Greek or Mayan or Hopi Indians. And so this is why I think we need to spend a lot of time on this, because we have enough information in hand now to go, oh, yes, there is a scientific historical basis to these stories. Now, let's revisit these stories and see what insight we can glean from them now that we have a framework, a scientific framework, a geological framework for understanding uh, these events. Because a few generations ago, that framework, that perspective wasn't available like it is now. Nobody was looking at you know, impact proxies at the Younger Dryas boundary 30 or 40 years ago. So there. All right. Awesome. All right. Well Fantastic. done. Well, Kronos has donned his crown, <laughs> so it is time to end the podcast. All right. Yeah, we're yeah. pushing two hours again, so. Okay. Let's. Yeah, let's, these, we've gotten a little out of sequence and uh, announcing things, so the best best way to go about it is to go to randallcarlson.com and sign up for the newsletter. Yeah. But we, we're going to continue to have two, if not three or four tours a year. We got the lower Cumberland coming up in November. Some concerns about, uh, you know, change in rulings and where we're going to be able to access, but we're still planning on doing that. And then we've got, uh, another contact at the cabin out in Montana this time to see the, uh, see the lake area. Right. Uh, Great floods part two. Yeah. Instead of the eroded area, we'll see where the lake was that provided some of the erosion. But everything is, the landscapes are just as spectacular in their own way. Absolutely. So, yeah, and again, the, the links are always in the too. video description yeah. Yeah. to the website for the newsletter, for the videos, for the tours. We got to go swimming in Flathead Great. Lake. Yeah, that's go that's flathead what lake. we want to do. <laughs> Well, I imagine there's some places that uh, you can swim. Now, this time, right, Brad, you said we're going to go up to Deep Lake and there's going to be some cliff diving there? Over in the Scablands, yeah, we're going to make it over yeah. there. That's right. on the cool. agenda yeah, this yeah, time. Yeah. Excellent. All That's right. right. All right, guys. Well, well, I want to mention one more thing just to remind okay. everybody that the only authorized source for my work is randallcarlson.com, Cosmographia How Tube. There is the site that um, is still continuing to sell my work. 
uh, that I receive absolutely nothing from. It's all going to the administrator of the website who, for whatever reason, has convinced himself that he's now entitled to sell my work lead people to believe that they are supporting me when I have nothing to do with it anymore. So I just want to remind people and also spread the word that, you know, that, that, that entire website at sacred geometry international based upon my work has been hijacked. All right. All right. Must be said. Carlson.com folks. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night guys. Good night. Good night. night. All right. Have a good one.